This is Toledo Symphony Lab, a behind-the-scenes look at the world of classical music from WGTE Public Media and your Toledo Symphony. I'm Brad Cresswell. Joining me today are the Toledo Symphony's President and CEO, Zach Vassar, also TSO Marketing Director, Vanessa Gardner, and we have a very special guest right here in the studio with us. Let's bring on the fanfare. That is Jeff Fumsal, who is Executive Director of the Spokane Symphony. Welcome, Jeff. Uh, welcome. Good morning. Yeah, we're glad to have you here. I guess my first question is, what are you doing here? <laughs> I don't really know. He I got just, lost uh, in Detroit. He yeah. <laughs> couldn't find his way lost to on Glendale. The way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Spokane, Toledo. It's easy to confuse one for the other, I'm sure. Not really. I mean, it's well, they're in different sides of the country, but otherwise the cities are rather similar. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, we'll find out more about the city a little bit later on because mm-hmm. I do have a little uh, four question Spokane quiz, which I'm going to ask you, Jeff, Uh-oh. to make sure that you know you you are who you say you are, <laughs> right? We'll see. We'll see. And if you get it wrong, we'll say that it's an unspokane delight. <laughs> <laughs> I was just waiting for an excuse to use that <laughs> that on my soundboard. So, Jeff, I'm Saul is here. This is kind of a slightly more serious subject, if you couldn't tell, I could tell. That, that we're <laughs> that we're going to talk about today. Um, it's our final podcast of of this season. It's been an incredibly unusual season, unlike anything. I mean, we've talked about this quite a bit. How orchestras have trying to been. Uh, adapting to the pandemic over the past year and how many different changes we've gone through, so many different things to talk about. So this is kind of a roundup of of what we talked about, but also looking forward and and where do we go from here. So that's what we're going to talk about during this this program today. But uh, Jeff, before we start talking about that, and I assume you have things to say about this as well, in, in your capacity running a symphony there in Spokane, mm-hmm. um, what we usually do when we have a guest on is have them tell us their story, right? Mm-hmm. You tell us a little bit about yourself so we get to know you. You can either take it back to when you were a little kid or you can start, you know, this morning, what you had for breakfast, wh- whatever you want to do just to to give us a little insight into uh, who you are and what it is you do. I've got some music for you. Let me pull that up. Excellent. Okay. (laughs) Okay. So whatever you say, it's got to match the music. Uh Uh-oh. Okay. Take it away, Jeff. Okay. Well, first of all, thanks for having me on today. It's great to be here. You're welcome. Uh, Thank you, Vanessa. (laughs) Um, Thank you, Zach. And... um, my name is Brad, by the way. <laughs> and and nice to see you, Brad, as well. well so that was a great story. Thank you for sharing. Um, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> okay. Yeah, so uh, where to begin? So I've been running orchestras for, um, for a while now in different parts of the country. Um, I've been in Spokane just over five years. Um, I am originally from the East Coast. I'm from upstate New York and uh, college in Boston. I was a trumpet player for a long time, went to NEC. Uh Um, And then after that, um, thought about my path and thought about music and thought about some alternatives and stepped away from music for a little while and uh, and then pretty quickly got back into it, but through the lens of... uh, of administration, and so I, I really found that was a great place that I could make a difference, and um, it's it's been a great career so far. So I've I've spent time in places like Fargo, North Dakota, and the Quad Cities, uh, Iowa, and Illinois, um, Marin County, California, and uh, and now in Spokane, Washington. Now you you hit a couple of spots there that that had a personal resonance for me. First of all, I'm a graduate of, of New England Conservatory in Boston. Also, I suspect a few years before you, uh, when I graduated back in 19 something or others, and uh, also uh, I'm from the Quad Cities. So, How are you? I didn't yeah, know that. I, I Where? Was, uh, raised in Moline, Illinois. No way. Yeah, I had no idea. That's amazing. So Zach and Vanessa, you guys can leave. I'm gonna hang out no with way. Jeff That's here. That's amazing. <laughs> I like the Quad Cities a lot. It was a great yeah. place. I mean, I find you know every place I've been, um, there have been similarities, there have been differences. Um, I I guess what I love about the work that we all do here is um, that we make our community the best it can be, and I think yeah. we are a, a place where community can be created and celebrated, uh, and those differences can be. Uh, felt and um, it's just a it's a wonderful thing to do. So I, I want to do Jeff's story 2.0 and bring in Vanessa and Zach here and, and have one of you two, Vanessa or Zach, tell us 
how the three of you met and how you came to, you know, how Jeff came to be here with us today talking about these very important mm-hmm. subjects. Uh, Vanessa, do you want to do this? You want to talk a little bit about it? Let me pull up some music for you. <laughs> Pass. I, I, here we go. I must have met Jeff through Zach. Possibly. Because, yeah, I think I introduced you. Yeah. yeah, so I'm sure it was, you know, a dark and stormy night in some hotel bar in New York City. and Possibly. And uh, the rest is history. You just explained, like, 15 years of my so life many right things. there. Um, also very noir. I like that. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, we ended up seeing each other at conferences, mm-hmm. and I became the food and beverage manager of the group, and I would <laughs> constantly um, plan our conference convening dining experiences so that, you know, we could all hang out. And the last uh, last time we really got to hang out, I didn't see Jeff much in New York back in 2020 because he was in and out. But the time before that, we went and had lobster rolls and mm-hmm. walked around New York. And um, so, yeah, I'm always just planning the food so that we can <laughs> all get together and share share stories and tales and make each other laugh. And we do a lot of that. I, I have to say that I'm really disappointed you didn't bring any food in the, today. Yeah, I'm still on lobster rolls. <laughs> yeah. So we have this wonderful organization in our industry that uh, listeners might not know about. It's called the League of American Orchestras, and it's kind of the, the unifying hub of this industry. And it encourages a lot of sharing, and it, it encourages a lot of coming together. And that matters because when we each work in our respective orchestras, we're doing the same job, very similar job from town to town to town, Mm -hmm. but there are very few opportunities to seek synergies, seek new ideas, and these conferences bring us together to do that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I first met Jeff in Dallas at a uh, midwinter meeting, and uh, I was impressed because he had the different orchestra perspectives from all the different stops along his illustrious career and he could really um, be a purveyor of best practices and he was also a fun guy Mm -hmm. and uh, and and that was the same meeting where I met Vanessa for the first time and you were uh, executive director in Texas at that point and Mm -hmm. I think we had all started around the same time in in our roles in 2016 and uh, you know, for me being kind of new to this industry, it was an opportunity to learn from the two of you and uh, share ideas. And I think this has become a wonderful opportunity to, to learn from each other and develop kind of a family of support. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, it's a great opportunity for us to, to kind of let listeners in on these discussions behind the scenes, the things that you're talking about and where you're going. You know, um, people know what's happening, sort of, with with the season next year, as far as repertoire and all of that goes. But let's let's go back and have a conversation about how, first of all, what you learned from this past year and and how it's being applied to this next year, and also um, <clears throat> let's set the stage by talking about where we were before all this began, mm-hmm. right? So set the clock back pre-pandemic um what where were we what was the state of performance in the country and and what had you planned for your orchestra what what did you you know hope what were your hopes and dreams i guess for the upcoming season jeff do you want to jump in and tell us a little bit yeah the uh the 19 2019 2020 season the one that was, of course, interrupted and in, uh, probably around March for most of us mm-hmm. was uh, was a big one um, for my orchestra because uh, it was our music director's first season and we had just done a music director search and uh, our music director, James Lowe, had been um, in Spokane on and off and had done about, I guess, five major concerts with us and some other you know, smaller things and lots of donor stuff. Um, and we were going to end. We were going to end that season with Mahler too. Actually, <laughs> we were just talking about Mahler too. Uh, we worked Mahler into the conversation, <laughs> so you get extra credit. Okay, for that. good, good. Zach is a big Mahler file. If, if never heard know. of him. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so you know, we all experienced this, you know, slightly differently. But I think there was a unifying aspect too, which was it's hard to sort of gauge where this thing was going to go. Um, I had been actually away uh, from the orchestra for a few weeks and and came back um, into town uh, something like March 7th or so 2020 
And that was right when, you know, mm. all these numbers began climbing in a way that felt like something more was going to happen. And, yeah. and Pacific Northwest felt it before the Midwest because mm-hmm. there was, I think, Seattle or Portland. Yeah, a, right around Seattle the yeah. was, the, was the beginning. That's right. So there was a little heightened sense of uh, concern. Um, and and that uh, public policy reflected that, you know, pr- pretty quickly yeah. things began, we, we were began forced into changes. Um, so we, like many orchestras, uh, suspended our operations for, a, you know, a short period, which at the time was a big deal. I mean, turning mm-hmm. off concerts, turning off everything. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, as we know, that that then turned into, you know, more and more delays and cancellations and then around... Um, around July, we made the decision to basically sort of transpose our entire 2020-2021 um, season to the future. And and this year that now we are just finishing, all of us, is our symphony 75th anniversary. So we had, you know, all yeah. sorts of things planned. Um, great guest artists and great guest conductors and, pe- you know, former music directors coming back from all over the country and all over the globe. So it's been Without yeah. doubt, really, uh, just incredible amount of uh, of constant change. It's been really hard. Well, I, I think that we can safely say that we're gonna we will take that year out of the equation, so you can still have your seventy fifth anniversary. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's like the thirteenth floor. Right. Right? <laughs> Nobody has number thirteen yeah. in the elevator. Yeah. We, we yeah. skip it, so <laughs> you go right to seventy five. Um, Zach, and, and and also for you, Jeff. Um, th- this whole technology thing. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, we we all know what people have done with technology as far as communicating with the audience. But I mean, moving forward, where do you see the technology affecting how we present th- this repertoire? Yeah, it's a, a great question. It's it's um, it's so key right now as we all consider our future. And I, I just want to zoom out for a minute and say, when I first heard you talk about technology, I thought, well, just in even tracking this virus, right? Mm-hmm. Without the technology that we have, without the communication, how different would it have been? Yeah. Uh, I wonder, even 15 or 20 years ago, I think it would have been fairly different in the in the trajectory that we saw. Um, now, in our worlds, in, in symphony world or in, in concert hall world, and I want to sort of zoom out again for a little bit. So in my role, I'm the executive director of the symphony. I, we also own a theater, beautiful 1700 seat restored theater. So um, normal times, we would be producing something like 150, a couple hundred shows a year. Now of those, a lot are symphony shows and a lot are things that are a little bit different. Um, we pivoted pretty rapidly. Um, we turned ourselves like many orchestras basically into a, um, a film production studio. Um, uh, we just completed last week the final of a bunch of weeks of recording, uh, busy, hard weeks, um, ending with another Mahler, Mahler 4. Um, and we had something like 15 cameras in the hall. We had two sky cams like you would see in, in NFL, sort of zooming mm-hmm. over over the stage. Um, really interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, and a whole team working on it. So. The, the work product is astounding. It's beautiful. And there are things that you can do on video that you can't do so well live. We have interviews and we have um, demonstrations and it's this whole sort of culmination intersection of art, science, uh, and history. Um, and that is wonderful. However, and I'm going to save this a little bit for later, what I think we're finding is that, yes, technology is fantastic. And what people want are incredible, seamless, end-to-end, sublime, in-person experiences. Mm -hmm. So this, I think, will be a little bit later in our show. But um, (laughs) what I'm learning is that while people like what we're doing and that there is going to be a place for it on video, they love the the community that happens uh, Mm -hmm. by coming to a concert. Yeah, absolutely. There's nothing that substitutes for that. But it, it's also a communal experience, and, and going to a concert is not just to mm-hmm. sit there and hear the music. It's also to see and enjoy everybody else yes, yes. Mm-hmm. hearing the music w- with you. So it's a, it, it's a social gathering, yeah. mm-hmm. and, and obviously that has been affected by what's been going on over the past year. Um, Zach or Vanessa, you know, you guys did put on a season. You kept things going. You kept the music alive. And even when there wasn't an audience, you were still able to present it through the streaming platform. Um, Can you talk a little bit about the the challenges you faced in keeping a season alive? And then 
how that developed into into where we're going in, in the future over this next season because you know thing things can change on a dime mm-hmm. i mean we're we're hoping that everything opens up again in the fall uh but something else may happen i mean who knows we're a little off balance right now so where do we go from well, here I, <clears throat> we have to look back to look forward i think because you know we were we were very lucky uh, thanks to the wonderful work that we did with wgte over so many years to create uh, TSO and HD that we had put together a lot of um, understanding of of in person video production and that left us with some archives but that also left us with a, just a different approach to thinking about music and video and as part of our strategic plan we had always discussed talking uh, about a uh, we'd always planned to have a streaming platform in the future but we were planning that for several seasons out because it was a major investment. And uh, when the pandemic came in, the, the quick thing that we realized we needed if we were going to if we were going to make a go at a season was that we needed to have that as a lever we could pull now. And that mm-hmm. meant that we had to very quickly build up the infrastructure to support that. And the reason we needed that is that while we while we hoped to have limited in-person audiences, we knew that if the numbers did crest as they eventually did in November, that would be the fallback. Because if we didn't have that infrastructure in place, there would be no fallback other than to stop doing performances. And so we, we felt that it, the, the integrity of the, the continuity of the season was important. Uh, what we didn't, I think, anticipate at that point is how much change we would have to do from concert to concert to concert, sometimes changing repertoire the week before the performance, which if you think about musicians having to learn their parts, takes a lot of extra work yeah. and also a lot of large mechanisms in our in our world that we need to um, acknowledge take time to change so communicating with the audience what is the program tonight a couple weeks ago we did a, a performance that was supposed to be Rachmaninoff second symphony it ended up being Lara St. John doing the Corigliano uh, suite from Red Violin and uh, people came out of there and saying I thought this was supposed to be Rachmaninoff. So try as we might, um, there are obvious points along the way where you know, yeah. the audience comes with us. They want those live experiences that Jeff was talking about, but it's not the same. It's not the same as a normal season when a lot of that stuff is considered fixed. And maybe that changes. Maybe we uh, we remain nimble to those sorts of changes in the future. Um, but we've definitely learned a lot about the sensitivities of the audience. So mm-hmm. now as as we look forward, we know that there are people who like watching programs at home. They like the ability to watch them on demand. They might not be able to drive at night anymore. And this is a way that they can continue to remain engaged. We also recognize that there are people in other parts of the country and on the globe that don't have access to this kind of content. So they also want to participate with it. So we've had some incremental gain in our audience that I think we want to continue feeding content to through streaming platforms. But we also want to get back to the business of having large audiences as soon as it's safe to do so. So that's kind of a, a delicate um, challenge because a yeah. lot of organizations right now are asking this question. Some in the in the context of should we invest in live streaming for the first time as they go into f- the fall of 2021? And they don't know if that would be a, a way to cannibalize their existing audience or to augment it. And I think the, the very limited science suggests that it's a way to augment it, mm-hmm. but it's always a challenge for an organization or an industry that's trying to grow audiences. How do you how do you grow the audience while not taking seats out of your own hall? Well, yeah. I think about the the term cannibalism. Ooh, yeah, you know. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's a it's a it's very gruesome <laughs> to to consider. But you know, think about our rates of attrition from for people who just like you said can't drive at night right. or just you know just no, stop coming for whatever reason or may not feel comfortable coming mm-hmm. back to the concert hall when everything is opened up again um on the one hand without streaming we lose that audience member altogether mm-hmm. on the other hand with streaming sure they might not be physically in the hall but you know we haven't lost them completely right. and and so I think that's nothing but a positive thing. I look at streaming as added value for the experience of mm-hmm. yeah. coming to the symphony. And, and I think, <clears throat> if anything, uh, my biggest lesson this past year has been we can do a whole lot more than we think we can. 
in parentheses with a whole lot less. <laughs> Let's not publicize that too much. <laughs> <laughs> Just ignore that but, uh, but woman think, behind the curtain. But there. it is. It. I mean, the word nimble comes mm-hmm. up. I mean, yeah, it would be great to have uh, to be able to plan a little bit further in the future than you know five days from now. But um, when when push comes to shove, we can do it if we have to, and we can still put out a really really great product and experience and mm-hmm. yeah. and and art. So. I I wonder about, you know, different orchestras, obviously, were financially equipped at different levels to deal with the technology that they needed to, to use to reach their audience. Mm-hmm. Has there been money out there or has there been any support from organizations to try to help shore up the, the, the technological abilities of organizations? Jeff, you want yeah, to talk about sure, that? Sure, sure. Um, and just to Vanessa's point real quickly, I mean, I think you know what we're all experiencing in, in orchestra world or performing arts um, is actually not so dissimilar from other industries too. I, I, we've all been parts of many you know webinars and, and listening to podcasts and reading articles. When somewhere along the line, I heard something like, "This is has sort of forced forward progress mm-hmm. of maybe you know ten years into a span of weeks or mm-hmm. or right yeah. you know some real forced acceleration." So, um, I think ultimately it's good. It doesn't mean it's not hard, and and I think mm-hmm. we've all been impacted personally, emotionally. And um, so putting that all together has been a challenge for, for lots of people. Um, you know, with, with our situation, we are very fortunate to have um, a number of really high quality video production um, groups in, 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 uh, in, our, in our locale. Um, there's one that we've worked with for, for a number of years, both with still photography and then now with video. Um, and he, um, this guy Don Hamilton, Hamilton Studio. He just loves the symphony. I mean, he's mm-hmm. just he just goes bananas for any ideas. <laughs> so, um, sometimes you have to like say, "Well, Don, we love these ideas, but we, we have the concert to do tonight. So let's get through <laughs> this one, and then let's explore it." But you know, this notion came up about the sky cams, and he went and he bought two of these things <laughs> and put them up, and he's um, wow. So you know, so he himself, I think, is the sort of the germ of this um, of this excitement and the and the ideas. Um, and then that is infectious, right? In the in the good yeah. way, infectious. <laughs> it gets donors excited. It creates a good narrative, right? Because we all rely on relationships, um, a relationship with the orchestra, a relationship with our board and our staff and the com- our donors and then the broader community. And when there's something interesting to talk about, people people sort of st- sit up a little bit, mm-hmm. and uh, and we have found that actually our donor base has been incredibly supportive yeah. and uh, and we haven't been able to do live concerts i haven't and actually we, i was at the concert on saturday night that was the first live concert i've been to since january of 2020 yeah. um so it's been a little different for us um and yet our donors continue to support right. us and foundations and and uh so that's been really really helpful well we i see that here yeah. Actually, yeah, too. i yeah. think there's great support for the technology aspect of it mm-hmm. and um the the Rita Barbara Kern Foundation, who underwrites this podcast, uh, has been, um, I would say, integral to our ability to do the streaming this year. Uh, the Community Foundation as well. Uh, but, you know, w- these are major investments at a time when we had to commit to those dollars. That we didn't know how we were going to keep everything spinning back in, uh, you know, June, July of 2020. But you know, thanks to that generosity and then the dro- generosity of the larger community, you know that that ends up being uh, an investment worth making. We we talk a lot about how we were just the right size um, financially. Mm-hmm. Um, we talk about our budget size. Uh, a lot of larger organizations, like the Met, for example, mm-hmm. they they were so large it was cost prohibitive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. to, well, so they say. Um, but then the the previous organization I came from was too small mm. to be able to um, afford to, to plow ahead. So mm. um, The Goldilocks effect. Yeah. <laughs> we, it's funny, we talk about yeah. the same thing yeah. in our community. We're big enough to have a presence, and, and that, that lack of presence is palpable, so people want to keep it going. Mm. Mm. Uh, but we are small enough to stay nimble and, and to pivot. And you just said something, Jeff, that I've been toying with a lot. So many people have said that the end of... Um, um, the the end of the experience economy is what we are experiencing right now. So if you think about going to museums, going to concerts, 
going to restaurants and for many communities across the country these experiences have been turned off or almost down to zero and and with that uh, you know accompanied by sheltering in place and staying at home you find people grasping for things that feel normal and maybe familiar but as those experiences were such a part of what we identify ourselves with by by taking them away um, we start to see what our world would look like if we only looked at a computer screen all the time, right? So um, as we've been able to continue doing performances, I feel like we're just a little drop in the bucket of that experience economy. You can't go to Imagination Station. You can't necessarily hug an animal at the zoo the same way you used to. Yeah. We've all <laughs> tried for to... for yourself. I don't... I never... <laughs> uh, what kind of animal are you talking about? Because well, I was thinking like the black bear. No, I go for polar bears. Polar bears, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. They're give very him, gentle. Give them a hug. Yeah. That, okay. that, so yeah. snuggly. Carry so on. Snuggly, yes. He was a good conductor. Um, <laughs> but... The, uh, oh my! <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you. I was waiting for that. Yeah, uh, wouldn't be a show without it. But as the experience economy has has, I think, maintained itself here in Toledo much better than other areas, we might not know how fortunate we are. Mm. Even just going up to to you know, twelve miles north of here to to Michigan at various points of this crisis, we've seen a very different reality. So, if we were ever to think of a horrible science experiment. To take that one step further, what does the world look like if you turn off the arts? What do people do? You know, is it, do, do they do they notice it? They, do, they binge watch. Do they need it? Television yeah, shows. Well, <laughs> they binge watch television shows. Sit on the couch. Yeah. And um, and and in some ways, that is an experience of art. You know, that's that's a replacement for your experience economy right now is to to go to Netflix and and binge watch something. Um, but you you don't necessarily have the same sense of craft or creation. No offense to any of the actors on any Netflix programming, but um, that sense of community is not present, and that sense of in the moment is not there. And um, and 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 that is what the arts provide. It also provides this this really strong ability to change your prerogative in a in a meaningful way. And if you look at everything our country has experienced in the last twelve months. Besides a public health crisis, a lot of political question marks, a lot of civic instability, um, we need art to find a way to conceptualize our responses to those crises as well. So it's been a terrible time for us to lose the arts nationally as we have yeah. and in so many communities. But I think the end game, th there will be a story of triumph. You know, we've gone through the story of how do we survive mm -hmm. and, and how do we keep providing some semblance of our service you know we're we are speaking today from inside the classical music bubble of mm -hmm. course and, and jeff touched on this a little bit and you've talked about it zach that you know there's a whole big world outside of there that has been affected by this as well mm -hmm. as we all know mm -hmm. but eventually we're going to hit our stride in the sense that people are going to want to socialize again and if we can make what you do presenting music in public and live performance, a part of that narrative, a part of that that tragedy to mm -hmm. triumph story, mm -hmm. then I think that you can find ways to make it uh, resonate with the public and people will start coming back. I mean, I see the crowds growing already a little bit mm -hmm. in sh people that have been showing up to the symphony performances mm -hmm. now that you can have some people there. Mm -hmm. And what you see in those audience are the people that, that you might think of as the most vulnerable of the population. You know, you see a lot of older people. Of course, now many of them have been vaccinated to feel safe to go out in public. But I think there's a core constituency there that is looking for that story of triumph at the end. And I really think that orchestra performances in some small way can be a part of, of that story. What do you think of that? Do I do I get applause for that? I don't think so. You have the soundboard. Yay! Okay. Yeah. Good. Well, I didn't want to seem too self-serving. Well, look, I think there's an, a bit of an <laughs> irony here, which I think we're all sort of touching around the edges of. It. We all want to sort of find ourselves, and sometimes to do to do that, you have to lose yourself for a minute. You have to sort of be in this um, saturated experiential environment mm -hmm. uh, with beauty that is that is you know oral beauty, visual beauty. And, and the community of, of people that are like-minded. Um, and we have all had that moment where you're sitting in the concert hall 
and um, it's somehow restorative internally for ourselves uh, and you leave a little bit different so I mean I think well, I myself um, I love that moment I, I've we've all had that moment so many times but it is fleeting right it is not you can't just make it happen no. Um, and so much work goes into that. We, of course, are the ones making it happen, doing it, <laughs> knowing all the little things that have to get figured out. Um, but for a sort of just a regular audience person who comes a few times a year, I think that's what they're coming for. They're mm -hmm. coming for what it does to themselves. Mm -hmm. And you could make an argument that after the year we've all had, we need beauty and hope uh, throughout this last 12 months in a, in a very aggressive way. But um, having that moment provides that that adrenaline rush and uh and and we will come out of this if history is any barometer that we will be able to see that people will be craving that because they've they've watched everything on netflix uh the, the that experience economy coming back online whether it's a baseball game or a beethoven symphony will be uh, an important piece of their puzzle Mm -hmm. Yeah. Before I let you guys go, Jeff, I have a, a quiz for you about Spokane. I oh. want to see I want to see how you do. We're going to do a little flash quiz oh, here. Okay. We'll, we'll be sending this podcast to your yeah. board. Yeah. So this is this I is like the, the test. Mm -hmm. yeah, make sure you are who you say you okay. are. So, uh, I have a I can imagine one of the questions already, but okay, let's All right. go. What does the name Spokane mean? Oh, um sun uh sun god or daughter of the sun or something. Close, you're so close. <laughs> Children of the Sun. Okay. That was that was pretty close. Jeff I'll give it to Zero, you. Merwin won. <laughs> yeah, Merwin. Merwin always wins the quiz whether he's here oh, or not. Come on. I think I get partial credit for that. Okay. Uh, Spokane is home to one of the largest urban waterfalls in the US. What are what is the waterfall called? What are they called? Spokane Falls. Oh you're right. You got it. <laughs> I jumped the gun. Okay. <laughs> Spokane Falls. That was easy. It's like who's burying Grant's tomb, right? Except it's Grant and Mrs. Grant. So. <laughs> Spokane easy Falls and Mrs. Spokane Falls. <laughs> <laughs> yes. What is the city's nickname? Lilac City. Very good. Wow. What's you, Toledo City's nickname? Lilac City. Um, hang on. <laughs> Glass City. Yay! Yeah, Yay! yeah. Glass City. Yay but there, there's that. another one too. Another nickname, Frogtown. Oh, you know Frog that? Town. Yeah, oh, okay. Frogtown. Give myself an applause for that one. Okay. What holiday originated in Spokane? Father's Day. Yeah. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> This is Cognitive bias. What's going on? This is how I feel in yeah. every quiz. That's right. I often get buzzed for things oh, I think. Really? It's a good thing I'm not in charge of, of the pandemic response. Okay. Uh, that was it. Did I hit the question that you thought no, I was going to ask? I thought you were going to ask me about the World Expo. This is Expo. the way that you get oh, to the ask World Expo. Brad a question. So what, what year was the World Expo in Spokane? It was just this past year. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was on. It was in tune. That was in uh, tune. Well done. Yes. Yeah. 1974. 1974. Well, that's what you get for being a trumpet player all those years, right? Okay. I don't usually play in tune. Wow. So uh, let's just do one quick little Spoken round. Like a French and, horn. and let me ask you uh, the the question that brought us here all today is where do we go from here? Um, where do you see things? Let's say a year from now. You know, if a year ago today you were asked, where would we be a year from now? You know, would you see yourself where we are? Um, let's move that down one more year. <laughs> Vanessa's over there with her slide rule trying to figure out what I'm talking about. I was told um, there'd be no math. <laughs> yeah. If you, uh, okay. Let's just uh, say goodbye. See you next week. <laughs> everybody, everybody, just, just quickly, though, tell, tell us where you see us a year from now. Well, you know, if I think about where we are right now, uh, 12 months ago, I would love to have been where we are right now. I think we've kind of shot beyond the 12-month vision. I think we've we've done a lot this year. I think it's exhausted us for all the reasons we've talked about today. Yeah. A year from now, um, if I had to put my bet out there, I'd say that um, we will prove ourselves to be much more elastic than we expect. And we've shown that elasticity through the last year and all the ways that we've adapted. But I think we will actually want to spring back very quickly to uh, to our, our before times. But the after time is going to be different because we're all going to take a little bit from, uh, from this time. So 
I think that we will be doing performances. I think we'll have many more people in the hall. I think we will see ourselves also thinking about our community and our case much differently than than we have, uh, even though those are things that we often talk about. Uh, but I think this is going to give us a very sincere, incredible way to address the art form and and, and address what we are responsible for in, in, in the Toledo area. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> There's a dentist drill again. <laughs> Thank I you. I'm to hit this one. You got it. There we go. You yeah. had all summer to figure out how to work your soundboard. Uh, I need new glasses. The problem is, it's sort of like you know, erasing the Nixon tape. I have to, <laughs> re- I have to like reach way over here with my arm, and yeah. my how, foot how has go to go you, back the there, and, <laughs> in order to to reach my soundboard. Vanessa, you want to chime in there? You think that uh, Zach is on the right on the right wavelength of what he's saying? Absolutely. I I also think that. Um, if I have anything to do with it, we'll be demystifying the the symphony concert experience and and just really um, connecting with people so that you know people don't feel uncomfortable coming to the symphony. They know what to expect. They have a good time. They just enjoy the music because music is just music, and that's for everyone. And so, um, and and for those that choose to watch at home, I look forward to. Um, you know, breaking it down a little bit and providing a different experience for streaming on demand. Um, we'll still have the live streaming option because I think people do like to watch the performance live, even if they're not there, they want to experience it live. Um, but then after, um, you know, we'll put together some really great programs that, um, you know, for someone who has never, um, doesn't know all the musical terminology, will be able to connect. So uh, I'm looking forward to those projects. I think it's going to be a great year for that. Yeah. Excellent. Jeff, I'll give the last word to you. Where, where are we going to be in a year? I think we all want to get back to what we know. And I think the challenge is there's only going forward. There is no left of boom. There's only right of boom. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, you know, I look at it like there's a sort of risk management, sort of, uh, you know, performing to um, the gap that we are experiencing now. And then there's an opportunity gap, right? Mm. So so what haven't we thought about, right? To me, that's the more interesting thing. What new things can we commingle together? We talked a little bit about new ways to just operate our organizations. Are there opportunities there? Um, I think from the patron perspective, there's going to be an enormous hunger to experience mm. a lot of really high level uh, music. And I think it's our opportunity to, to rise to that occasion yeah. and to not underwhelm to to actually really push as hard as we can. Yay! I would say there is no phrase or thought that I look forward to less than going back to normal. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Not right. interested. Not just in not just in the performing arts, but just in, in mm-hmm. life in general. Mm-hmm. Not interested. Right. One of the questions I love asking people is what have they brought out of this pandemic? What have they learned about themselves? Maybe a, uh, a talent that they built up, a hobby that they've experienced, but what do they take with them from this experience? Because that's going to be the difference about not going back. It's that everybody has something and every organization has something that they've they've adjusted, adapted, and inherited through this time. Mm-hmm. I think that's going to be the a very productive way to, mm-hmm. to, to look through this tragedy. This program is a production of WGTE Public Media in collaboration with our sponsor, the Toledo Symphony, with generous support from the Rita Barber Kern Foundation. You can download episodes of this program as a podcast by going to our website at wgte.org lab. You can also subscribe to us through your podcast app of choice, including Apple and Google Podcasts. And remember, you can stay connected with the symphony through their various social media outlets on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And you can find those streaming concerts online at stream.artstoledo.com. My thanks to Zach Vassar, Vanessa Gardner, and our special guest, Jeff Umsall. I'm Brad Cresswell. You've been listening to Toledo Symphony Lab from FM 91.